Welcome to the Independent Advisors Podcast, where we dive into the world of stocks, tradable markets, and financial planning with Jessup Wealth Management's Chief Investment Officer, Mark McEvely, and CEO, Matt Jessup. You'll hear tips, tricks, and strategies to address your financial well-being, and most importantly, conveyed in a way that everyone can understand. Here are your hosts, Mark and Matt. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 182 of the Independent Advisors Podcast, where Matt Jessup and I, Mark McEvely, bring you everything you need to know uh, from the past week in the world of financial markets and financial planning. So uh, happy, or excuse me, merry late Christmas to you, Matt. Merry late Christmas and happy preview of the new year coming, Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. How was uh, how was Christmas this year? Did Santa treat you well or did you get cold this year? <laughs> <laughs> Feels like I got cold this year, the way the market's been. Yeah, I know. Right? Uh, but no, the kids kids had a had a wonderful Christmas, um, good time with uh, with family the last you know week or so, so uh, definitely looking forward to the new year. Yeah, I am as well. I am as well. Uh, and before we begin, as always, just want to take the first few minutes to recap the performance for the month and the year of the major indexes that we track, and these numbers are as of the market close on December twenty eighth, and this data is from Y Charts. S&P 500 index down 7.3% for the month of December and down 20.6% for the year. Dow Jones Industrial Average down 5% for the month, down 9.5% for the year. NASDAQ Composite Index down uh, 11% for the month and 34.7% for the year. The Russell 2000 Small Cap Index down 9% for the month and down 23.3% for the year. Uh, and the Vanguard All World X United States ETF is down 3.9% for the month, down 18.6% for the year. So continued relative strength out of international stocks. Um, three month T rate, or excuse me, three month Treasury rate at 4.46%, two year Treasury rate 4.31%, and the 10 year Treasury rate is at 3.88%. So still inverted on all of the major rates so far. Um, big news headlines uh, from the current week, Matt. Uh, obviously, we've talked um, in depth over the years about the Santa Claus rally, which is the last five trading days of uh, this year, plus the first two trading days of January. Um, and Santa has failed to show up this far. Uh, so the S&P 500 is... In typical 2022 fashion. Yeah, yeah. is down approximately 1% uh, for the Santa Claus rally time period. So there uh, are two more trading days this year, obviously, uh, this morning and tomorrow. And then um, two more trading days, the first two days of the year. Uh, to complete the Santa Claus rally. So in total, four more trading days for that Santa Claus rally to push into the green, which is very possible. It is possible. It is possible. Just uh, so much pessimism. It's, it's a very poor month, obviously, for the for the equity markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And typically, you know, and again, as we've talked about several times from a seasonal standpoint, December tends to be pretty good. Mm -hmm. I think the last really, you know, really poor December was in 2018, 18? I think. Yeah. yeah, I remember yeah. that pretty well. So bad quarter. Yeah. So I think, again, a lot of people are looking forward to the beginning of 2023, at least from an investment standpoint. Correct. So uh, moving on to tweets, articles and research from this week. The first thing I had was a blog post from Callum Thomas uh, from his weekly chart storm. Uh, so he every, always has good stuff. Yeah, every week he posts uh, 10 charts in regards to the U.S. markets or the S&P 500 that he finds interesting. So yeah. uh, this most recent one that he posted, uh, I have uh, a chart, and it was the first thing um, out of his 10 charts, and we'll have Jenna throw this up on the YouTube page in our show notes. Uh, it's titled Lost Decades. Plenty of folk out there will tell you to buy and hold in dollar cost average and focus on the long term which is all well and good, but just be mindful that lost decades are actually relatively common, especially if you expand the sample to other countries and stock markets. So what you're going to see on this chart is periods of time where the market didn't really go anywhere for a 10 year time period. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the other thing that this doesn't take into consideration is people also contributing to their accounts over this time period. So it's not like they contributed everything right at the top and then they didn't make any money for 10 years. And also, you know, if you're someone who is not a, like I'm talking pure buy and hold, like they never sell 
anything, mm -hmm. then more likely than not, you're going to be getting into some investments at lower periods than just the top, unless you're just like, hey, I'm owning the S&P 500. I'm never going to sell it. I'm not contributing to it. I mean, that's the only way that you really, I guess, truly have a, a lost decade, which I don't think is the majority of people. But well said. Um, well said. You know, it hasn't happened in a long time. Uh, last time it happened, it ended in you know 2013 ish, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. Um, from the the blow up in the early 2000s from the tech bubble. Um, but it's it's not out of the question that Followed this could, by the great financial crisis. Yeah, it's not out of the question that this could happen again sometime soon. So I just wanted to highlight that. Yeah, it's possible. It's possible. Uh, but again, you know, if you're contributing to your accounts, if you're not a pure pure buy and hold S and P five hundred, more likely than not, you're gonna you're gonna get better returns than nothing over a decade. Well right. said. Um, second thing I had was an article from Bespoke on December 23rd titled, How Did 2022's Most Loved Stocks by Analysts Fare? No, this will be good. And they said 63 Russell 1000 stocks began the year with at least 90% buy ratings, while 52 stocks had less than 20% buy ratings. Oh boy, here we go. You want to guess how the... It's the opposite the of the most all. loved stocks did it, to not loved stocks. It's probably the opposite of, of, of both, right? So the 52 stocks with less than a 20% buy rating by analysts are currently down an average of 10.7% year to date on a total return basis. The 63 stocks with 90% plus buy ratings are down an average of almost 23%. All right, so I want, more I than want, double. I want you as well as our viewers and listeners to remember this. Because one of my last uh, pieces of research is what Wall Street is estimating for the returns for the equity markets next year in 23. Yeah, and I actually just I added something to my arsenal of future podcast topics that talks about 2023 predictions. So I oh, yeah. should probably have that out next week. So well. I got a little preview then for you. Great. All right. Uh, last but not least, last thing I had, um, the SECURE Act 2.0 uh, has passed Congress and uh, I believe is going to President Biden's desk for signature, which looks like it's going to be signed into law. And one of those things that's in there, Matt, that we had talked about previously this year is a change to 529 college savings plans. Yep. So this was a tweet from Max Pershman, CFP. Um, back on December 23rd, and it was a screenshot of a CNBC article, just the title of it, that says families can make tax-free rollover from 529 plans to Roth individual retirement accounts starting in 2024. So the key provisions of this uh, is that you can only do this up to $35,000 in your lifetime. Yep. And the IR, the Roth IRA that the money from the 529 is rolled into, it must be for the beneficiary of the 529 plan. It can't be for the <laughs> owner. So parents can't take advantage of this or grandparents for that matter. Um, and we'll discuss this more in depth in a future episode sometime soon. And maybe we'll have Aaron or Taylor or both of them on to discuss the major. Yeah, there's uh, a lot. There's a lot. Yeah, the major changes in Secure Act 2.0. Oh, but I think this is something that's huge for people oh, because, yeah. you know, when people are deciding whether or not to contribute to 529 plans, the biggest question mark that we have that comes up is like, well, what if my kid doesn't go to college or Boom. what if my kid gets a scholarship and they don't have to touch the 529 plan? Yes. In a lot of instances, I mean, obviously it's transferable to family and whoever really, but in a lot of instances, people are kind of stuck unless they want to pay a penalty and pay taxes, right? Which at the end of the day, if those other things occur, not the end of the world. In my not view. the end of the world. If you're not using the 529 money, things are probably okay for you. Um, but this is just a, another way uh, for people to have more flexibility with these 529 accounts. So uh, very, very happy to see this uh, be a part of this plan. So I think I'm looking forward to digging into the um, all the changes. It's pushing back R&D age. There's a lot of things that are happening. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff that's not going into effect immediately. And a lot of it is in like 2024, 2025. And mm -hmm. 
I think an RMD age going up to 75 is pushed out to like 2033 or 2035, something like that. But um, at least we have visibility. Yeah. Yeah. And Aaron sent us an article uh, that kind of outlines all that. So maybe we'll do either a special podcast dedicated to that or have Aaron and Taylor on here to talk about the major highlights sometime in the near future. It's great. You ready for me? Go ahead. My first piece is just um, some raw data that's really pointing out, Mark, that there's lots of positioning for more downside for the markets. I find this interesting. So the first source on this is a research firm by the name of Game of Trades on December 20th. And Jenna will put this chart up for our viewers on YouTube. This will also be in our show notes. And what it does is it goes back to about 2013. And it shows, in essence, the um, number of uh, put to calls. So in essence, option trades where people are indicating that the market could go lower or they're betting that the market's going to move higher. And we are seeing kind of um, record levels of betting to the downside most recently. Right. So if you're looking at this graphic, the higher the number, the more people are putting on protection that are betting that the market's going to go down. Correct. And then as I had this piece of research teed up for the podcast, two days later, Bespoke Investment Group, they had the same data, Mark, but they went back to 1997. So mm -hmm. now Jenna will put this chart up to get even a larger kind of viewpoint. And when you look at this chart, and viewers will see it as well, what do you notice going back over 20 years on this chart? Yeah, that when you get, you know, ele elevated levels of, you know, the put call ratio, markets tend to rally. But the, <laughs> the caveat is this year where, you know, it's gotten to those levels where fear is really high and we're still going down. Right. Exactly. So, I mean, I mean, we're we're pushing up way up on levels that we really haven't seen before. And, you know, I think that people are probably like, well, Matt and Mark, you guys have been talking about this for several months now and That's the right. market's still in a downtrend and I get that and I understand that but at some point <laughs> something's got to give yeah I just want to throw it out there that I think 2023 and this is going to be my, my big takeaway on this joining the predictors and forecasters 2023 <laughs> is going to be a year that if you are to miss out on even five to ten of the best days we don't know when those are going to occur in 2023 mm -hmm. we miss out on five or ten of those I would argue that will make up, it could make up over half of the returns next year. Hmm. Just those upwards of 10 best days. Yeah. So I think it's going to be really interesting. I think that this is a market that is really, really challenging to time on a shorter term basis. Yeah. And those, you know, those quote unquote best days happen when you have a large amount of people that start throwing in the towel, right? That's They're right. Like, hey, can't take this anymore. Yep. And the more and more we see of that, 10 makes me think that we're getting closer and closer. And I know a lot of the things that we're talking about today, it seems like we've been talking about them all year, which a lot of the things we have. That's right. Um, but again, these things will resolve. It's just going to take some time. So it's a perfect segue. So my next piece is from Brad McMillan. He's Commonwealth uh, Financial oh. Network's uh, chief investment officer. And he had his 2023 economic and market outlook he released on December 21st. And I want to remind our listeners and viewers that if they would like to follow his blog, all they have to do is go to the Independent Market Observer. That's his blog. And he usually has updates about at least once a week, but sometimes twice a week. This is the summary that I would like to share with our viewers and listeners from his 2023 economic and market outlook. Here we go. First, um, will 2023 be another tough year? He says, I don't think so. He oh. thinks the U.S. consumer should remain strong. Feels like a recession is likely, but he thinks it'll be shallow and short as long as the labor market holds up. Said that the damage to the markets in 2022 is real, but heading into 2023, the markets are fairly priced, in his opinion. And interest rates are near where they will eventually peak as well, he said, again, his opinion. He said that earnings continue to be a concern for the market, but thinks the economy will continue slogging along. And that's the exact word he used. Do you like that word? It's good. Slogging. slogging. Yeah. Said that he can't say how good of a year 2023 will be, 
but he thinks it'll be substantially better than 2022, and that's a quote. Says that the fundamentals are sound and the markets are better than they look, and that is not a bad place to start the year. Yeah, and I think it's, be- you know, it's obviously, I don't want to say a better environment. We're in a very different environment there we, than where we were to start the beginning of 2022, where valuations were still pretty high. Hadn't, you know, the markets pretty much doubled off of the COVID low. Um, and now we're in an environment where, you know, we had a really bad year in the markets this year. Um, valuations are a lot cheaper than they were last year. Sure. Um, going into a, a pre election year from a seasonal standpoint tends to be pretty strong. Mm-hmm. So I think it's not a hard argument to make that going into 2023, there is much more upside. Um, and given the fact that markets usually aren't negative two years in a row, they happen. We talked about that last week, I think. Sure. Um, but I think there's a lot more uh, optimism going into 2023 than there was going into 2022, just based on, uh, you know, market fundamentals and certain events that have happened. Um, but, you know, I think the major argument going into 2022 was the same argument that we've been talking about for the past five years, that, that valuations were insanely expensive. In right? comparison to history. In comparison to history. Yep. Um, and that has still come in. I think we're still, you know, above average. And we've talked here before about, you know, maybe markets justify higher valuations these days because companies are more efficient. Um, and we're still comparing, you know, times from 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, I just think that argument is now not as big of an issue because of the sell off and all these tech companies coming in and their valuations coming in. Um, so I think. I agree with him for the most part that, you know, there is a lot more possibility of optimism for 2023 with the caveat that anything can happen. Absolutely. Well, the final thing is, you know, Wall Street tends to be uh, they can get on the bandwagon on different themes. Right. So my my last piece is Wall Street is pretty negative on 2023, Mark. So the source of this is Compound Advisors on December 20th. And then now Jenna's going to put up a chart for our YouTube viewers, for our traditional podcast listeners. We'll verbalize it, but I would recommend you look at this. Uh, This goes back to the year 2000. And this uh, source is underneath it is Bloomberg. And it shows Wall Street strategists, their average, they combine all of them and have their average for what they think the next year uh, the S&P 500 is going to do. And you can go back in time and kind of see what their predictions were. And this is the first time since 2000 that on aggregate, Wall Street's thinking that next year is going to be a negative year. It's crazy. And what's interesting to me is what this says to me is Wall Street is kind of thrown in the towel. No one wants to put their neck out there and make and say, a call mm-hmm. that next year is going to be a good year. Right. And that's telling to me. It's very telling to me. Yeah. And I think, you know, I th- the article that I read today was along the same lines here. But yeah, if you look at this chart, you know, over the past more than 20 years, there's never been a consensus estimate for, for negative, negative returns. Right. You know, you combine it with just with all the, the negativity out there and, you know, there's a difference between how a lot of these stocks are trading right now and their underlying fundamentals. And at some point, something's got to give. Mm-hmm. I would actually think I would rather see this, though, than oh, absolutely. If, if they were like, I'm not complaining. The market's going to do 20 percent. Exactly. And everyone thought that I'm not complaining about this. Yeah, but I definitely think it's very interesting mm-hmm. that no one no one wants to you know stick their neck out right now. That makes sense. I'll do it. Not that anyone cares or anyone should care. Or the market thinks what I th- or cares what I think, but I think it's going to be better than people think. I am on the same page with you. <laughs> so back to you. Uh, moving on to the financial planning topic of the week. This was an article written by Alan Roth on AARP. AARP. Uh, yeah. Talking about, fi- and I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer here, but uh, talking about financial moves you must make when a spouse dies. Okay. Um, So he starts off by saying, simplify your finances by decluttering the number of accounts you have and make sure both of you, 
meaning both partners, um, are partners in your financial matters so that the other isn't left clueless. This also protects both of you in the case of cognitive decline. Make sure your spouse knows your wishes and write them out in the appropriate estate planning documents, such as a will. Step one is to learn some basic terms of the estate administration process and get organized. You are likely the personal representative, meaning it's your job to administer the estate. And to do this, you'll need several important documents. Be sure to get five to 10 original death certificates. Financial institutions and others will need to see them before they can do any anything for you. So do you wanna talk a, a little bit about that more in depth Matt, because I think there's, you know, a misconception that, you know, if, if I'm the POA on somebody and mm -hmm. they die, mm -hmm. that I can still do whatever with their accounts. But I, I don't think people realize that once that person passes away that you're POA for, that POA ceases to exist. Correct. So, you know, quote unquote, legally, to be able to do anything with that account, you need to notify them of the person's death and get a death certificate over to them before that could be distributed to the proper beneficiaries, right? Correct. So just to reiterate what you said in my own words, when you have a power of attorney on somebody, you can transact the powers that are written in that POA up until when the person is no longer with us. <clears throat> so if the underlying individual passes, your ability to exercise any sort of uh, financial decisions cease to exist. At that point, it really depends upon how the account is titled is going to be how accessible that money is going to be immediately after passing, mm -hmm. right? So if there are named beneficiaries on the account, tends to be a relatively quick process, right? If you don't have named beneficiaries and it has to go through probate, that money could be tied up and locked up for upwards of six months, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and I think the, the common misconception again is that, hey, if, if my partner dies, <laughs> I'm able to access that money and pay for funeral expenses and, and, and other things right away, and that's not the case. Because if, it, if it is in your deceased spouse's sole name with no like name IRA. beneficiary, right? Mm -hmm. With no, like, and you're not the beneficiary immediately of it, direct transfer, you're exactly right. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. And still, even even if there is a named beneficiary, because it takes time to get the death cert, I'm no, talking like within days after they're passing. Oh yeah, oh, some they, people, I've talked to people that are like, hey, I need to get money out. And we're like, point. hey, we have a fiduciary obligation and we let our custodian know, hey, this person has passed. So yep. they restrict the account. They lock it down. Absolutely. Until we get a death certificate. And then we're able to, to move that money according to the beneficiary. It's usually a couple or, of weeks before, usually at least a week before they get a death right. certificate, sometime multiple. During and, COVID. It was a long time. And then you had processing time, you know, to, mm -hmm. to process, you know, move the money to the beneficiary, get the money they need. It's quick at times, but maybe not as quick as people think. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. It's if you have named beneficiaries, definitely a lot quicker than yes. the, the probate process. Yes. I'm glad we talked about that. Yeah. Um, he also says you will need bank and brokerage statements and tax returns. I found that often tax returns help you to discover accounts you never knew existed. Good point. You need to quickly notify certain parties of your spouse's death. This includes financial institutions, the IRS, Department of Motor Vehicles, Social Security, and the spouse's employer. Cancel accounts for recurring services or products in your spouse's name if you are not using the service or the product. You will likely need to obtain a tax ID for the estate from the IRS. Take an inventory of all material assets and liabilities. Finally, you may need to update your own estate plan since your late spouse probably had a role in your previous plan. Social Security is typically a key source of your income. If your spouse had a higher benefit, you are likely entitled to receive that benefit but your own monthly check will stop. Yep. You may be entitled to other benefits as well, such as a widow or widower's benefit uh, or a benefit if you have a disabled child. If your spouse had an IRA, you are probably the beneficiary and can roll it into yours. Even death doesn't escape taxes <laughs> and you will likely have to file a final tax return in addition uh, to a return for the estate itself using that tax ID that we discussed previously. I was going to joke with you. I didn't want to stop your progress because yeah. you did a very, very good job there. 
but when you were talking about um, you know canceling accounts for reoccurring services or products in your spouse's names, that include uh, wine subscriptions, <laughs> wine clubs. Probably, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rachel has. <laughs> Boxes so, of wine showing up to the house. If something happened to me, she would like redirect these to Mark McEvoy's yeah. house. <laughs> right. And I would happily accept. Happily accept. Just just uh, give me a little toast. Yeah, that's right. Um, so it's, you know, again, we never like to, to talk about death or talk about anyone's mortality, really. But um, it is it is an important conversation to have. And, you know, I've had me and Kenzie have had this conversation. And, you know, just because I'm in the industry, she likes me to handle all of the finances and everything and, sure. and she doesn't like me talking about me not being here someday but it's a very real possibility and she's going to have to know how to handle all this stuff so it's yeah i mean at the beginning i'm going to read that that first uh sentence again it says make sure both of you are on the same page and you understand financial matters so one isn't left clueless that's a very you know important topic mm -hmm. and so one thing i would throw out there as we kind of close out the financial planning topic of the week mark is if you are in that situation and you are the non-dominant financial spouse, you need to start asking some questions. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be immediate, but maybe that's one of your uh, New Year's resolutions for 2023 is to get more knowledgeable just about finances in general. Yeah, and it's a lot of this stuff is is not as hard as you think or as hard mm -hmm. as people think. A lot of it, yes, it is. A lot of it's really complex, but... The majority of it, I think, you know, if you talk to somebody that's in the industry or talk to your other spouse about it, you'll be able to grasp it. And you, you just need to know a high level overview of, of what some of these things are. This is where the money's held. And I think that's the biggest roadblock for people is they just automatically think that, like, I'm going to have to spend so much time on this. It's really going to be hard to wrap my head around it. Yep. I'm not going to understand it. So they just kick the can down the road. Um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, if you know you're unhealthy and but you don't want to go and put yourself on the scale, you don't want to get blood work done because you know it's going to be bad and you just keep pushing it out, pushing it out, pushing it out, you're going to die sooner probably, right? Yeah, good point. Um, so, you know, if you know things are going to need to happen when your spouse passes away, then why not take the necessary steps now to make it easier on yourself in the future? Well said. So. Well said. Um Anything well, else, last, Matt, this before is the last we, podcast yeah. of 2022 182 here. is the last one of 2022. Uh, we, just as much as everybody else, is, from a, a market standpoint, happy to see this year come and go relatively quickly. This year felt, it felt pretty quick to me. Yes, there were times where it felt longer. <laughs> um, it was like Groundhog Day kind of over and over again with yeah. the way the markets were, but I think it felt relatively quick, which I don't know if is a good thing or a bad thing, but... Um, I yeah, would say, I, um, you know, my, my, my parting comments are expect volatility to continue into the first quarter. Um, I think that the market is definitely wound. I think you're going to continue to see in the short term big movements to the downside and the upside. Expect that to continue uh, because right now this market is pricing in unknowns. And that's what's causing, in my opinion, a lot of these uh, moves and they could correct to the upside. We don't know when that's gonna be. Could be weeks, could be months. But when it happens, I think it'll be quick and fierce. So do not try to time this market. That's mm -hmm. my words of wisdom. Yeah, very well said. Well, thanks everybody for listening to episode number 182 of the Independent Advisors Podcast. And uh, thank you all for listening throughout the whole year. Uh, we're hoping to put out uh, better and more content next year in 2023. Yes, I know Jenna are. probably has some big things planned, but as always, uh, don't hesitate to leave uh, comments, reviews, things you want to see more, just so we can put out more content uh, in more digestible ways and, and talk about things that you want to hear. Um, so don't hesitate to, to give feedback so we can make 2023 better than this year. Looking forward to 23. We'll see you then, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Independent Advisors podcast. If you're interested in hearing more, hit the subscribe button so you can be notified every time a new episode gets released. Feel free to share with friends, family, and follow us on Twitter at Jessup Wealth, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Mark and Matt will continue to share beneficial information on these social media sites. Also, check out the podcast tab on their website. That's www.jessupwealthmanagement.com. 
There you'll find links to every episode of The Independent Advisors. Have questions or topics you want to discuss on the show? Message us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or send an email with the words questions and topics in the subject line to inquiries at jessupwealthmanagement.com. We'll talk about it right here on the podcast. Certain sections of this commentary may contain forward-looking statements based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. All indices are unmanaged and are not available for direct investment by the public. Past performance is not indicative of future results. This podcast is provided for general informational purposes only and does not constitute either tax, legal, or financial advice. Although we do go to great lengths to make sure our information is accurate and useful, we recommend you consult a tax preparer, professional tax advisor, financial advisor, or lawyer regarding your specific circumstances. Investing involves risk, including the loss of principal. No strategy can guarantee any objective or goal will be achieved. Advisory services offered through Commonwealth Financial Network, a registered investment advisor.